Like uh, the first time I saw it was in Slovenia with Mike Stern in 1999, maybe. <laughs> like a, okay. a, long, a long time. That sounds ago. about right. That sounds about right. Yeah, and you, 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 you know, I was just, you know, I love Mike. I'm a guitarist, of course, but I was just focused on you <laughs> playing the bass, man, and uh, just the solos you had and the groove. I think it was Dave on drums, Weckl, and but uh, I wanted. Okay. I wanted to start like asking you when does your story with Mike begin? Like I know you guys played together for such a long time, but when when did you start working together? Well, I'm trying to think when I met Mike it was probably, you know, uh, middle '80s, probably '85, '84, '85. Play with him on and off with different people, and I think he was still playing. He was still playing with Miles, or at towards the end of the period that he was playing with Miles. And he, you know, he'd gotten, you know, himself back together from whatever mm -hmm. problems yeah. he had, personal pro problems he was dealing with, and he was really fit and really playing great. And him and Bob Berg were in the band together at that point. And then that sort of, you know, they moved on to other things, and and Bob and Mike decided to do a band together, and Jeff Anders did the band for a while. Oh, yeah, exactly. But then I don't know what happened with Jeff. Jeff got busy, or he got busy playing, I think, with Wayne Shorter and doing some other things, or... I don't really know the details, but you know, they got they got Dennis to play. They started get using Dennis on drums, and they started yeah. using me on on bass, and then things kind of took off. And we did a pretty nice, solid run there for you know through the very end of the '80s into the yeah. first half of the '90s. Yeah, a lot of backroads and in the shadows, right? Those two, yeah, records. I yeah, know, and we did some nice records, records too. Back yeah. back in the day of tape. I mean, Bob yeah. was amazing for me. One of the greats of tenor sax, like yeah. really a monster player. How, how was it like to play with him? I mean, like the that was great. He was always he was he. They, those guys were like animals, you know. They were just like putting it out 100 percent all the time on stage. It was great, yeah, great stuff. Incredible. Right, and yeah. we had very very good reception. Very very well received. Um, we did we always did big venues, you yeah. know, festivals festivals and big halls in Asia and Europe and it was great it was great yeah. it was a great run yeah I mean you, you mentioned Dennis uh, Chambers and drums and yeah I, I checked you on which records I have you and I, I think like Dennis Chambers Dave Wackel Steve Gadd I think on one like for a bunch of uh, South American drummer amazing drummers like with, you as a bass player all these drummers are monsters you know and like what changes for you when you play with Dennis or opposite to Dave Fleckel, or does anything change? Like, how would you compare playing with all these incredible drummers? Well, they have, they all have slightly different styles, but they all have some things and they all have some very important things in common, which is really, really good time and very, very musical, very, very musical and very, very interactive in the, in the way that they orchestrate uh, the songs and always listening to the groove and always reacting to dynamics and um, I think people tend, people, listeners tend to forget that, you know, Weckl and guys like Weckl and especially Dennis have mm -hmm. a lot of technique, but they also had uh, very good ensemble skills in terms of how they played and reacted to what was going on. They weren't just up there, you know, putting on a drum clinic all the time. Yeah, it was, sure. there was a little bit more to that. And I think that's what, what was, uh, what was enjoyable about it for me. It wasn't, um, I was just suffering through somebody's drum clinic. It was we we were we were talking to each other, yeah, and we were learning from each other, and and I was learning from from them, and they were learning from me, and uh, they had very very uh, specific things that they wanted to achieve, and I uh, and I learned a lot from playing with them, yeah, in those types of rhythm sections, especially rhythm sections with Mike, uh, yeah. in the trio context or in or in the quartet context with the horn, because there was no keyboard, so there was no keyboard temperament. And I was able to orchestrate and play things that I probably wouldn't play if there was a keyboard player. 
Yeah, I saw you playing like many times. You played chords also, and I mean like you a, lot know. Of, a lot of chords and a lot of changing around of octaves, and 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 I was sort of not that I was consciously taking the place of the keyboard, but I did a lot of things that I probably would uh, let the keyboard player take care of in a key in in a situation where there was keyboards. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. It's uh, it's beautiful. Uh, but I, I want to. Uh, Speaking of Mike, I wanted to ask you because he had such a strong association with Jaco. Like you, you remember when you were growing up? I mean, like already you were a teenager when Jaco, or even later, you were like in your early twenties when he kind of popped out. You remember those moments when he, when you became aware also of him because he kind of. I remember. I actually remember the very. I, I remember the very specific moment. I oh, was really? playing. I was playing in a band out in the West Coast. I was still in Oakland, California, where I grew yeah. up, and I was playing with a band out there. In a club, and I heard this. Uh, I heard Donna Lee on on the radio, and I went, "Is that a trombone? What the fuck is that?" You know. I yeah, mean, I was. Really, yeah. And then I figured out that it was Jocko, and and it was kind of, you know, I didn't, I didn't immediately try to play like Jocko, like a lot of my my contemporaries did, partly because I wasn't interested in doing it, and partly because I just simply didn't have the chops to try to, to play like that. I never played Fender jazz bass. I was always a a P bass player yeah. and an upright player, and and the sound I, I liked what he was playing, but it, what it, but I didn't really necessarily want to go for that sound uh, that he had. But uh, and then Weather Report came out, and it was like, wow, we all became Weather Report freaks right away. So it was yeah. a huge it was a huge influence. And I when I moved to New York, I had an opportunity to see him live many many times at the Brecker Brothers Old Club down oh, yeah. on. Avenue. Yep. Did you ever go to that place? Well, anyway, Jocko used to play there, and I used to sneak in. I used to tell the club owner, "You got to let me in. You got you. Come on. You know, are you, are you crazy? You got to let me in." And I got right up close to Jocko, oh, man. and so I could see his note, the hairs on his nose, and I could watch him play, and I could see him, what he was doing, and I learned so much from that visceral experience mm -hmm. of being able to see Jocko. I mean, of course, he was crazy, and he was a scary guy, and he was not. Uh, you know, he had a lot of problems that sort of got in the way of him being uh, somebody that I'd want to come up to and say, "Hey, Jocko, teach me that." You know, because he he was like sort of like, but I could watch him and I could I could I could yeah, get the music transmitted into me from from. There's really nothing like seeing uh, a, a, an artist like that in person live when you're in the same room moving air. It's not like watching somebody on YouTube. Oh it's sure, yeah. Simply not the same. It's simply not the same. I really am grateful for the experience of being able to see guys like Jocko and Paul Jackson and oh, yeah. Steve Swallow and Eddie Gomez and I, I, I could I could list a hundred guys, a hundred bass players, you know, uh, you know Mike Richmond and Ron McClure and blah yeah. blah. You know, I could I can think of so many players when I came to New York that I was sitting right there, three feet away from them. Yeah, getting the air off the off the base and learning stuff. It was great. Yeah, it's it's funny. Like I, I did these talks with all of them, like Ron, Mike, Steve. And yeah, it's incredible. All these guys, you know, like Steve did albums already in 1961 or something. Like you know, it's like it's bizarre when I think about it. Like yeah, he's been around. He's like he's he's in his 80s now. Yeah, I'm, and still. I'm actually uh, I'm actually working with them. I'm doing this. Uh, I'm doing a record now. I'm in the process of recording a record. It's a, it's a bass choir record, and one oh. of the arrangements, uh, one of the arrangements that I'm doing is a Steve Swallow arrangement. Which one? And it, uh, it's a it's a Charles Mingus tune called Vasarlene. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's a kind of a ballad from that era in the, in the early '60s, and uh, and he did an arrangement of it that's masterful. It's like Mozart. It's it's beautiful. It's, it's it's for, for four bases, but it really sounds more like six or seven bases because they're all double stops and it's all very thickly orchestrated. And I really had to study, still studying how to how to record it. But it's I think it's going to be something really nice. When it, oh when man, it's, looking yeah. forward to hear that. Wow. Well, well, yeah. you, you mentioned all these bass players. Like when yeah. when you were growing up, like who, who was the the first guy on the bass? that kind of stunned you that you said like oh wait a second uh, i really want to do this or especially in jazz terms i mean well it wasn't jazz really it was when i was you know a teenager and it was a psychedelic era and i was in the bay area san francisco yeah. and all the psychedelic bands were playing and i heard jack cassidy playing i heard jack cassidy playing with the jefferson airplane hmm. and jack cassidy um 
Jack Cassidy was one of, you know, now in retrospect, I realize that Jack Cassidy was a bass player who incorporated jazz elements into his playing, like Jack Bruce did. Yeah. So guys like Jack Cassidy, guys like Jack Bruce, uh, and this is before I, I, I made the transition into playing jazz, and I was still wanting to be a rock player, you know, that was, for me, it was like Hendrix, Zeppelin, yeah, sure. Jefferson Airplane, um, you know, psychedelic music that, you know, it was, it was the summer of love, 1967. I was in like the ninth grade. It was like, <laughs> I didn't really go into, into the jazz uh, thing until I, a little bit later on when I was, you know, 19 into seven, 18, 19, I started, I started uh, listening to jazz and, 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 and getting more into the upright and, and studying, uh, studying classical bass, learning how to play with the bow, all that kind of stuff. Mm. What what was the trigger for to for going into jazz like needing a challenge or musically or? Well, hearing specific records, I think, uh, and mostly it was Miles. I think it was Miles that, that that got me into it. So, kind of blue, and then later on, Bitches Brew, and yeah. uh, uh, in a silent way, and those kind yeah. of records. It was like wow, you know, when he when he sort of like when he sort of started playing more like electric music and I heard it and I went wow and then I went back from there into into the traditional stuff and started studying you know the bebop rep repertoire and the hard bop repertoire and uh and it wasn't it, it, and right at the end of my when I was in the west coast Steve Swallow was living out there and I studied yeah. with Steve oh really oh wow. I did yeah I studied with Steve when he was out there playing uh for whatever reason he was in residency out there in the bay area and I I saw this guy playing a five string bass and I was like, wow, I got to get some of this, you know? So I, I just went up and hit him up and he was the nicest guy and he showed yeah. me stuff. He's a really nice guy. Yeah. yeah, I learned a lot from, from him. Yeah, such a melodic player also. I mean, you know, it's all about the melody when I hear him. It's... And a great and a great writer and a great Yeah, master. Eider Down and all those Falling Grace. I love those songs. Falling really. Grace, wow. Ooh, the changes, man, like beautiful stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, but what, what might, what made you then decide to move to New York? Because I know you moved to New York like in late mid seventies, right? Or... I moved to New York in nineteen seventy-seven. Seven. Okay. I was playing in a band at the time, uh, a band called Night Flight with uh, with Steve Gabori. Steve Gabori actually he's still in New York. He's the musical director for Cindy Lauper. Oh wow! And he sort of went into that, got in, got into that sort of genre a little bit. But he was uh, he had a band called Night Flight that was a piano trio with two singers and. Uh, the drummer was getting married at the time and we said let's go you know we were young and crazy we didn't we had no fear of anything so we said let's go out to New York and see what's happening out there and kind of ended up staying and even after the band dissolved we we all sort of most of us stayed there and I made New York my home yeah did, did, did you were you also part of this loft scene that was kind of slowing going away there yeah before? I got in at the tail end of the loft scene when there was a lot of playing going on there was a lot of uh, people who had for very cheap rent very big yeah. spaces in in places like where they call Soho now and in Midtown and uh, uh, on, on the Lower East Side a lot of the, a lot of places they had these lofts where people would play and there was always something to do there was always something some place to play mm. there was always some, there was always gigs too I mean I, I I look back on that time and there were so many places to play and yeah way different than now yeah i mean like okay now it's a little we're bit different yeah it's it's a little bit different for a young person coming up now trying to get on the scene i think yeah for yeah. sure and how did you then get immersed because you know i, I have it like on this uh tanya maria record and i checked it's yeah. 1981 or 82 and you know you played with paquito and michelle camilo and uh like how did you get involved in the latin scene because you know the first time when i saw you I related you with fusion, you know, kind of Wayne Krantz, Mike Stern. Of, that's yeah. how I started with jazz, you know, where I saw your name. And then I started investigating. Well, I saw you, you were like hugely involved in the Latin scene. And how did that happen? I don't know. It was always something I was interested in doing. And it was one of the things that I that I, that I I thought you needed to have in your palate as, as, as a player in New York. If you could play a tune you could get a gig. And here I was in, in the capital. Uh, and it was the golden era of, of Latin music. There were a lot of places to play, and I used to go up to the Bronx. I used to go up to the Bronx, and I, and I took lessons with Joe Santiago and Andy Gonzalez. I studied with these guys. Yeah. 
Uh, I saw I, I, I went to their gigs and I watched them play and I, I would go to their houses and I would study with them and they would play me records and turn me on to the repertoire and there was no uh, s sort of sense of secrecy or anything about you know this somebody who was technically like a n non Latin studying the music it was and I appropriated it into my my repertoire you know I think one of the things that I probably do well at this point in my career is I play a lot of different styles and I have a, a, a good foundation in a lot of different styles. Definitely, yeah. So. And how did then the gig with Tanya Maria, for instance, happen? I mean, because... I think I I was, I was hooked up, I, I Gato Barbieri was auditioning, Gato Barbieri was auditioning bass players, so I forgot who hmm. told me, but um, I'm trying to figure out whether I was playing with Gato first or with Tanya first, but I actually I hooked up with Portinho, the drummer, right? I've yeah, known him yeah. for a long time and he was playing with Tanya and he was also playing with Gato uh, and he told me that Tan Tanya was looking for a bass player he said come on come on let's go let's, let's let's go play with Tanya and let's you know because she's going out on tour in France and blah 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 and we played and I guess she liked it and she took me on her her tour in France and I sort of oh, wow. learned, learned on the fly a lot of the, a lot of the vocabulary from her uh, on the bandstand, it wasn't always easy, you know. She, she wasn't. It wasn't always an easy school with her, but it was. She was very, very hard grooving, and you know, coming from, yeah. coming from a Rio de Janeiro and playing the clubs in Rio de Janeiro, she was playing the real stuff, you know. She was playing the real shit, and I learned a lot from playing with her. How was this first? This was the first time you went to Europe, also with her, or? No, first time I went to Europe was with Gato. Gato, and how was yeah. that like for you? Because we're talking about, you know, the former Europe kind of, you know, with Liras yeah, and uh, Deutsche exactly. Parks and everything. Yeah. So 1979, I think. Wow, already. Okay. 1979 with Gato and he did a big, he did a, it was a major festival tour in, I think 1979 or I think, no, I think it was 1980. And I went over there and we, we toured for a whole, um, for a whole month. It was great and they were all major festivals and it was pretty amazing. It was a, it was a, a culture shock for me. Yeah, yeah. No, that's why I, I love hearing these stories from everyone coming to Europe, you know, in 70s or 60s or 80s, or when it's, well, you know, it was Yugoslavia where I live now. And Yeah, we played in Yugoslavia. Know, and, oh, really? Yeah, yeah, we played in Yugoslavia on that tour. We took a bus to Yugoslavia and we played at some outdoor festival. I remember it was very muddy, some sort of muddy outdoor, I don't know, soccer stadium or something, but it was very rustic. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. that's how it was. <laughs> Depends where you were, but yeah, it's, it's an expression of muddy. Okay, I love that. I remember. Yeah, the, I, I just remember it being very muddy in the stage and everything. But there was <laughs> it was a huge event. It was a huge festival. There were thousands of people there. Oh, amazing! And yeah. I wonder where you were, Bel Belgrade, probably, or Zagreb. I don't think it was Belgrade yeah. or I, I Ljubljana, maybe. Right? Yeah. And, yeah, I think what was the last? What was the last one? You Ljubljana. I think that was it. Probably right. Yeah. Yeah, I think that was it. That was yeah, the yeah. festival. 1980. Yeah, I'll, I'll check back. We have archives. Uh, I'm really curious. Yeah, with Gato. We played with Gato. Okay, I'll check. I, I, I talked with Liebman and Liebman was like, yeah, man, we played in Ljubljana in 1973. Like, really? Well, who remembers that? Well, sh <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> That's awesome. awesome. Yeah. I remember we took a bus. We, 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 drove in, we drove through the border from another country. I think it was from Austria. Austria, probably. Yeah, sure. I'm not sure. Yeah, I think we went from Austria into Yugoslavia and played in Yugoslavia. Wow, amazing. The bus driver was insane, you know, he was crazy, he was driving, I thought we were going to die like about 50 times, you know. <laughs> so many times I've heard this as well when coming to <laughs> Slavia, seriously. <laughs> so. Yeah, very interesting, very interesting ride. Yeah, and how did then, you mention Paquito before, that you that you played a route with him in Finland. How did then the connections, you know, I guess, of course, you were part of the scene, but how did the connections with Paquito and with Michel Camilo happen and all that, like... I think it was also it was it was a rhythm section connection because I was playing with Portinho and I was playing with Galeri Franco mm. in the Brazilian scene and they were playing with these guys and it, one thing sort of led to another and I think there was an opening in Paquito's band I forget who was playing before me somebody was playing before me who and they had some commitments I think it was either Steve Bailey or somebody mm -hmm. and they got busy and I ended up uh, just kind of replacing him in the band with Portinho and Claudio Roditi and oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, with yeah. awesome, 
you know, this is before they all broke off into as into leaders as their own. We and we were, you know, I listened to some of those old YouTube and I'm going, wow, yeah. we, really, we really were playing, you know, it was, it was, it was pretty smoking. Yeah, the track record celebration, I have the, it, it's, it's killer. Uh -huh. Cla Claudio yeah. on trumpet, man, it's like. And the celebration, stuff. why so, not? We did the Magic why City, not. the Magic City is on it also. Explosion, that's another one I did with Paquito. Oh, really? Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah it's, it's incredible. It's just like, it's so groovy and. Uh, it's, it's beautiful. Did also like your connection with Dave Valentine help you in that scene or that was a completely different I started story? connecting. Yeah, that, that happened pretty early on. I remember I met Dave probably in 1978 at some kind of, oh, already. Some kind of a party in Manhattan, some sort of a, I don't know, like psychedelic art event party. And he was there and I was there and we were, you know, not really necessarily, um, uh, he was doing some, he, play, he was playing with somebody and I was playing with somebody else and he came up to me and he said, hey, I'm looking for a bass player. You want to come up to my place and jam? And this was this was right in the very beginning when he had just signed his first uh, record deal yeah. with GRP Records. And he he hadn't been out of, he hadn't been out of high school that long. Well, so we were all very young and, and, and I went up there and I played with him and he liked what I was doing. I was playing fretless and yeah. you could see that I, he could see that I had some, uh, some Latin vocabulary, but also some fusion vocabulary, and I think he liked also the fact that I, uh, I could solo, and I was I was playing, uh, I was I was playing over his arrangements, and and, and I think he liked that, and he, and I and uh, I got in the band, and then we played together was, for a really long time, right? We played together for a long time, on and off for almost towards the end of his career, Dave's career, you know, I can't even, I, we did a lot of records for GRP and, and yeah. other records for other labels after that, probably at least 15 records, yeah, maybe, yeah. maybe more. Wow. Uh, some of them were pretty awesome. I think the one that everybody um, remembers, or at least the one that everybody comments about to me is the one live at the Blue Note with Giovanni. Oh, yeah. I, I like uh, that one, Pipe Piper, that's tune seven stars. I think mm. you play fretless on there. It's so beautiful yeah, that you play. I remember so that beautiful. tune. I remember that tune. Yeah, so, and, and great recordings with Larry Rosen. It was every the sound of the instruments was so full and rich with that old analog tape recording. Yeah. It was a different. It was, a, it was that was the old A and R Studios where they they had the Musicians Union on 40, 48th Street. A and R Recording Studios, really established studio, it was there for a long time. I remember that place. Oh. We we did most of those records in that in in that studio in the studio. front studio. And yeah, our record. the sound is beautiful. Yeah, but even now when you listen to those records, it's like man. Yeah, you know, it's a special sound. Yeah, it's so beautiful. Real fat and rich and yeah, the, yeah. There's, there's something about that, something unique about those recordings. Yeah, and the, but you also I saw you, you wrote tunes for Dave. I mean for that group also. How did that start? Did he encourage you, or you just brought it? To the band no, or? he encouraged it. He said, "You got any tunes?" I said, "Hmm, yeah." But I actually didn't have any tunes. But I, I went home and I started writing some tunes for it. You know, the opportunity presented itself, and one thing led to another. And I had experimented before with writing music. I mean, it wasn't something that was brand new to me. I, I but uh, I, I, I wrote for the ensemble, and he liked some of the stuff I did, and it ended up getting recorded. It was great. What's your process when when you start writing? You know, like music you know, let's say that's venus brazil where you play like chords or even the the you know you're i, I listened to some some of the tunes that you wrote and many are based on grooves like you love six four at night and day you know like and but anyway like, what's your process when writing a song how do you proceed? i think the process i think the process depends it, it it's not always a, a, a it's not always the same process sometimes i'll start with a melody and then i'll craft things around the melody sometimes i'll start with with a groove, and then I'll, and then I'll try to craft a melody and, and a progression over that. Sometimes I'll hear a progression. I think the the, the thing that be, that I think I think the thing that comes most naturally is when you hear the melody first, and then yeah, you construct exactly. the rest around it. But you never know how the muse is going to hit you. You know, I go, oh, you know, it's a melody. Oh, I got I got I got to put this down. I got to document it. So, you know, I play a little guitar, a little keyboard, but not so much. Basically, it was just like a bass oriented. I would pick up the bass. And I would figure out what was going on in the bass, and then I would sketch it out. And this was before Finale. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody had home studios or any of that kind of stuff. So um, I would I would write it out on a piece of paper. 
I would figure it out just like you know I would sketch it out with a pencil on a piece of pa a manuscript paper and sometimes it would come together fairly quickly sometimes it would be something that I would have to have to labor over for for a little while mm. or sometimes I would have the opportunity to go out and try it out you know I'd go to Dave and say what do you think of this and he go yeah that's yeah, nice but try or sometimes we would collaborate with so oh, we're really? talking about oh, wow. sometimes yeah. we would collaborate where I would play I would write the A section and he would write the B section oh, okay that's cool yeah and it would come together fairly quickly in the studio we'd even do it in the studio we'd go into the corner and then just oh yeah let's try this okay that, that sounds great boom and then, then it was a, and then it was a tune oh yeah that's it yeah. Sort of spontaneous you know it goes, it's, yeah it's quite easy in that way then yeah but you've been like a, a sideman like a collaborator for such a long time on so many records and uh are you thinking like of making like your own album like really under your own well, i am making my own album right now I'm, i'm making this bass choir album which is my okay. own album there's, there's a there's a few originals on it but mostly it's arrangements of uh it's arrangements of uh Super. pieces of other composers in different genres i have some classical stuff i have some jazz stuff i have some funk stuff some herbie stuff some jocko stuff uh yeah i gotta put some jocko on there it's a bass record <laughs> some classical things i did i did I, i did some classical things i got a shostakovich piece on there and a mozart oh, piece. really oh, well, on the ebay yeah. or mostly ebay some some acoustic bass and also um i did a couple of compositions of um uh an icelandic composer a guy who passed away was a film score guy johan johansson hmm. a couple of his things are on there as well But I think it's very, very interesting stuff, and I'm going for a real high quality, uh, you know, recording where it's not doesn't sound like something that somebody did at home. Yeah. So it's a it's a pretty painstaking process to make sure all the tracks are clean. And I actually ended up doing a lot of the parts myself. So it's five Lincoln Goinses at once playing on one of the tracks. You know, it's like, but it's like I I discovered that you know if you want something done right, if you want something done a certain way, you do it yourself. So I just sure. ended up layering myself and then getting other bass players to solo over it like mike pope and victor wooten and john patitucci and, oh man wow. uh, tom kennedy also did some solo work on it Beautiful. um and steve swallow contributed an arrangement so there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of other bass players who are in the, in in this mix in this big suit but i'm basically the one who's sort of stirring the stirring the project and trying to put it together I, maybe it'll be out by the end of this year i don't know oh man beautiful looking forward there's to no that. there's there's no there's no time limit on it and i'm yeah, the yeah. one who you know and then there's nobody who's paying me to do it i'm just basically just doing it on my own sure. um you know and then in the pan, sort of a pandemic production you know yeah, yeah. <laughs> i would say it's a pandemic production because i did the parts and then i and then i say to victor hey victor because he's he teaches at berkeley too where i teach also i said hey victor you want to You want to try putting some bass on this? He says, "Yeah, sure." I send it to him, and instead of instead of, so, and it's great. Everybody gets inspired because I, I send him a track, and instead of him sending me back one track, he sends back eight tracks of basses. Man, that's beautiful. They're all layered with this weird, and then I get Dennis to play drums on it, or oh, wow, ben, okay, or Ben Porowski, oh man, or Robbie oh, man. Amin. So I have a bunch of stuff. I'm really excited about it. You can look for that. It's going to be called the Art of the Bass Choir. Oh, super! The Art of the Bass book. Choir. Yeah. Super. We're looking forward to that. But, uh, yeah. Lincoln, My I want to ask you yeah. uh, mm -hmm. about these bass, uh, all these bass players you mentioned now. Uh, how how was in the 80s or even now or in the 90s, let's say, the camaraderie between you guys? Because, like, is there, like, was there or is, like, a bass community? Because I always got a feeling there is bass players always kind of stick together. How was your feeling in the 80s, let's say, when so many... Yeah, it was a nice bass community. And, and the people that I considered to be my contemporaries, they were they were all busy too. So we didn't get to go like hang out and, and have a bass dinner or anything because everybody was <laughs> sure. on tour and stuff like that. But we would, we would see each other in certain situations and we would be aware of each other's work. And there was a sense of mutual respect and camaraderie and exchange. And every once in a while I'd go over... There were a couple of guys where I would go and I would... I would play with and get stuff from, and they would maybe get a little bit from me. Guys like Andy Gonzalez, uh, Jeff Andrews, yeah, man, I love this guy. Uh, uh, Wayne Pensewater, um, Francisco Centeno. I'm trying to think of some other people. Paul Sokolow. Uh, we would play a lot, and we would learn from each other. 
Mm. Yeah, that's um, beautiful. Yeah. And, and then they would go do their gigs and I'd go do mine. And sometimes I'd say, hey, I can't do this. Can you do this for me? And, and some, you know, we, we, We'd, we'd, we'd be aware of each other and we'd be able to, to you know, relegate work to each other and stuff like that. You know how it goes. Yeah, sure. You know, uh, make, and you'd always, I, I always knew that I was not going to make a bad choice if I recommended, for example, somebody like Jeff Andrews to play a gig for me. Oh, sure. <laughs> sure. So, you know, I mean, come on, you know, so. Yeah, yeah, it's beautiful. The, I also wanted to ask you about, uh, I read on your website, you played with Sonny Rollins. I did play with Sonny. And when did that happen and how, how did that happen? Because I, I couldn't find anything. Well, I was playing with Bill O'Connell mm -hmm. and and he he was uh, the pianist in the Dave Valentine band at that point, yeah. 1981, 1982. Uh, and also Sammy Figueroa I played with also a lot, the percussionist. Mm -hmm. And uh, they had played with Sonny and they were playing with Sonny or they were still connected with Sonny somehow. and. Word got through to me, I think through Bill O'Connell, that Sonny was looking to put a band together. Um, and he was holding auditions at a someplace in Midtown. And I went over there and I played with him. I brought my fretless and I played with him. And, uh -huh. and, he, liked what I, and he liked me. And, and he hired me for, for about a year and a half. I played with Sonny. It was, a, it was sort of a special, a special project. Uh, it was two guitar players and a drummer. It was Tommy Campbell. Tommy Campbell playing drums. And Jerome, uh, Jerome Harris. No, it was but no, it wasn't Jerome. Jerome would play bass with Sonny. Yeah, uh, I played bass, fretless bass, and Bobby Broom played oh, guitar. Bobby Broom, yeah, yeah, sure. And, and Yoshiaki Masuo. Oh, okay. Yeah, another New York, uh, yeah, uh, Japanese national who was living in New York at the time. Yeah. It was two guitars, so it was two guitars, and a drummer and a bass and Sonny. Really interesting oh. comedy. And we went over and we did, I we did some touring in the United States, but we did one major tour in Europe. Uh, I think it was in either the fall of 1982 into the into the spring of 1983. And I played with Sonny. I played with Mr. Rollins. I said, yes, Mr. Rollins, how are you? He says, don't, 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 don't call me Mr. Rollins. I said, okay, Mr. Rollins. <laughs> I was not going to call him Sonny. He said, call Mr. me Sonny. Said, okay, Mr. Rollins. <laughs> But how is he like as a band leader to you guys? I, I mean, he was very cool. He was very, very cool. He just went out and played his stuff. He was he was such a strong player that was just he just just sort of took us along for the ride. Yeah, you know he was like a huge presence on stage, and it yeah. was at a point in his life where he was still pretty young, and he was still you know relative you know not a young man, but he was still uh, you know I don't know that was in in the early eighties, so he was still about what in his fifties, fifties, yeah, yeah, late forties and fifties, and he was still playing very strong. I mean, he almost he almost didn't need a microphone. Yeah, wow. such a huge sound, and and he was very very into the the to, to the show business aspect of, of, of performing. He was always he was always for the people. He was always he would accentuate that to me. He would say, "Look, this is show business," you know. Like sometimes he felt like maybe we were being too introspective or too introverted or too jazz like he said come on go out there and play go out there and project yourself mm -hmm. you know other yeah. than that he didn't really say too much about what we were doing he just let us sort of do our thing yeah yeah that's beautiful yeah yeah, yeah. well what about the michael brecker i also wanted to ask you about him you i know you played with michael through I play mike, with michael but I, i i play with mike but it was mostly in situations local situations in new york Bob Mitzer had a big band and I played yeah. with Bob, Bob's yeah. big band. I did several records with him and, and Brecker was, uh, Brecker was one of the tenor players in, 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 in Mincer's band. Yeah. And I got the opportunity to play with Brecker in that, in that context. Yeah. You, you never played with, uh, Mike Stern, like a quartet or something? No, right? Like with Brecker? Brecker didn't, no, Brecker didn't, Brecker didn't do that. It was either, yeah, right. it was yeah. either Bob Berg. Or Bob uh, Franceschini later, or Bob, I guess. a lot of Bobs. You had to be, yeah. you had to be named Bob. You had to be named Bob to play in Mike's band. It was Bob, <laughs> Bob Berg, um, Bob Malik. Oh yeah, okay. man, I love yeah, this Check guy, this yeah. out. Check this out. Bob Berg, Bob Malik, Bob Shepard, and oh, Bob man, exactly. and Bob Franceschini. So four Bobs. Okay. Oh yeah. Bob Mincer, been, Bob Mincer should play with him also. Mincer and Mincer actually didn't play with Stern in should, that man. context. <laughs> yeah, you probably could have done it. Yeah, yeah. But it was funny, you know, you had to be named Bob and you had to play the tenor sax. 
to play with to play with Stern. Yeah, that's bizarre. It's so yeah. funny, man. But beautiful. One last thing, Lincoln, not to take too much of your time. Uh, I also one of the first records I, I bought that it had you was uh, Wayne Krantz's Two Drink Minimum. Yeah. You know? And I wanted to ask you, like, uh, how was it to play with, like with Wayne, like his compositions, his style? How did that band develop? And uh, how did you guys, when did you guys start playing, actually? How did that story We started playing you? together. We were playing, we were, L Lenny Stern. So, yeah. so uh, Mike's wife, she, mm -hmm. Had, she always had bands, uh, you know, mostly local stuff. But she was also a recording artist, and she had a band for a while with uh, with 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 Wayne oh. Krantz and I. And I forget who was playing drums. It was either Lionel Cordu or mm, yeah. I, I, or Adam Nussbaum. Somebody was playing drums, and Wayne was just starting to break out, uh, you know, his compositions as an artist on his own. And and at that at, at that point, we had already developed sort of a repertoire, and he was writing this very very deeply written composed stuff where there would be you know five six pages with codas and very very involved it was almost like a cl classical music situation Rhythm and i uh and i and i put in the time to, to 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 learn his music and i ended up doing i think two records with him one record yeah. was a studio record that we did at um at uh um the steely dan who's the keyboard player uh donald, donald fagan's place oh, yeah. on, 90, on 93rd street on the, on the upper east side Called "Long to Be Loose," and then we uh, we did a live yeah, record at the Fifty Five Bar, back when everybody was smoking cigarettes, and my bass would stink like a giant cigarette every time I got out of that place. Yeah. But um, those two records I did with Wayne, and we did and we did some touring. We went to Europe. We played a fest. We played some festivals in Europe in the early nineties. Yeah. Uh, did some touring in the states. Yeah, I love those two albums. I mean, two drink minimum for me. That's like yeah, he's an awesome guitar player, awesome yeah. musician. I mean. Yeah. And one of one of the one of the best guitar players I ever played with. Yeah, definitely. You know, super accurate, super clean, very very focused and dedicated to his own craft. He wasn't really ever really interested so much in playing with other people as he was with no, he's with playing his own compositions, yeah. which I really respected. I really res I really respect that uh, in 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 an artist. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Uh, one last question: If, if w what are you working now on as a bass player and as a musician, like lately? What are the things you well, practice when you practice? I mean, like, I would say at this point, I've made some somewhat of a transition at this point in my career from being a performer to a teacher. Although I still perform, uh, a lot of what I practice sometimes is related to what I'm going to prepare to teach. But that's not always the case. I think I've sp I've spent a lot more time in the last. 10 or 15 years uh, developing my skills as a, as a, as a real doubler so uh, and, and reconnecting with the upright bass in a way that I hadn't in a long time. I, I studied some classical, uh, I went back and I studied the bow with some classical players, some contemporaries of mine, oh, well, Paul well. Napkick and some other people here um, in, in, in New York, getting so, a little bit more acumen with the bow. Uh, and I got myself a really nice bass now. I got a lot, nice little Italian bass that sings like a bird, and I, I play it and I use it. So I, I, I'm getting opportunities and calls to do more things with the upright bass mm -hmm. oh. in the last 15, 20 years than I did before. I did, so, I did some pretty extensive touring with Michelle Camilo again mm -hmm. uh, in, in over the last 10, 15 years. Oh, oh really? Giovanni Hidalgo and Cliff really? Holman, and that was all upright bass. That was all upright bass. Where I would go out with him when he would rent a bass, which was not actually the the, the best yeah. situation yeah. for me because sometimes the bass was a real piece of shit, and I had to I had to learn how to play. I, I had to yeah. I had to rise right. above you know the technical challenges of playing a bass that that had been in somebody's closet for fifteen years. You know. <laughs> Oh, that's beautiful. Okay. Yeah, so working on yeah, you know, a little bit more studying the classical repertoire, I think, and a little bit more um, going back and relearning some of the things that inspired me initially as a bass player, uh, music of Paul Jackson, the Headhunter stuff. I sort of revisited and relearned that, and, really pass it on to, and pass it on to my students. Yeah, that's beautiful. You know, now beautiful. that I'm now that I got a day job, now that I'm now that I'm a professor at the Berkeley College of Music, which I am grateful for, especially in in these extenuated yeah. times when there's not as much touring going on uh, yeah. because of the pandemic you know I, I 
I used to go to Europe. I used to go to Europe every year. I used to go to Japan every summer. And that would be happening for 20, 30 years of my career. And then things started to slow down a little bit, maybe for one reason or another, but I think the pandemic definitely took a big took it took a big notch out of it for sure. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Cool. Thank you very much, sir. Yeah, thank you. Hey, very nice to meet you. <laughs> Dr. Jazz.